G'day expats and welcome to another expat chat episode, episode 38. Um, Happy New Year to everyone. It's a bit late. It's uh, beginning of March and uh, it's been an incredibly busy time for the start. Joined by my mate and colleague, uh, James Ridley, who's the Managing Director of APEC Region. James, g'day. G'day, Brett. And uh, I suppose welcome everyone to another episode. We've we've definitely been on a, a bit of a little break, haven't we? A bit of a hiatus, but... Shit, I'll tell you what, it's been a busy start to the year. I, I think we kickstart, Brett, on, I guess, the personal side. You had a, a pretty bad accident um, at the start of the year in January, actually. Why don't you tell me about that? Mate, uh, let's just say I had uh, visions of grandeur of becoming a jockey. Uh, that's now been hopelessly dashed uh, after coming <laughs> off a horse uh, back in January. Beginning of January wasn't the start of 2022 I was looking for, but long story <laughs> short, ended up in hospital, uh, nice little break across the collarbone, a plate eight bolts, uh, four cracked ribs, and uh, a partridge in a pear tree. So uh, it's a bit luckily I'm not a sparky or a plumber, so I don't need to use my hands. But, you know, in terms of, um, you know, the, the noggin's still working, which is the most important part at the end of the day. So folks always invest in good helmets is the uh, is what I've learned out of that lesson. But um, <laughs> certainly slow me down for, for January, so that's for sure. Do you reckon, I mean, after this experience, do you reckon you'll get back on that horse? Or get Mate, back I think on there's the a metaphor there. there. There's a metaphor there. I was talking to my daughters the other day and one of my youngest one, Anya, she asked me, Daddy, getting back on a horse. And I said, look, there's a life lesson there about you should do it. I said, whether I do it or not, uh, or whether I can jump onto one of those horses inside a shopping mall and you know, put the one dirham <laughs> coin in and go around that, that, that shit's the same goal. Um, who knows? Uh, look, man, I enjoy yeah. the horse riding. Um, I'm not an avid horse rider, uh, but yeah. I do enjoy it. And yeah, when you're out in the desert blasting along at a, a canter and a gallop, it's a lot of fun in the in the sand. Yeah. But um, yeah, Arabian horses are known for being fickle, and mm. um, yeah, my horse was uh, a bit of a bastard. Um, yeah. And um, yeah, long story short, tried to jump a wadi, which is a, um, a dried up creek bed for those not in the Middle East. And um, yeah, I wasn't expecting it, so uh, yeah, came off, and um, the rest they say is history. Yeah, it's uh, like from what I understand that injury, it's it's really common as well riding horses. I remember um, my father telling me when he was a physio for one of the NRL teams. This is years ago. They did a they did this stupid camp um, with a lot of the players pre season, and one of the activities was horse riding. And two of their good players came off in a similar fashion that you described. One of them broke their collarbone, the other one cracked their ribs, and they were out for I think the first uh, eight weeks of the start of the season. This is this is 25 years ago. Yep. Um, but uh, when you told me, I, I sort of messaged Dad and told him he's gone shit. He's like really common. Send him the X-rays and everything. He's gone shit. He's done himself a good job here. Yeah, yeah it, was, so, it was a, it was a nice <laughs> break. There's it yep. my, my shoulder actually shortened by about three or four inches, you know, because the, yeah. the collarbone broke and then it overlapped um, over the break. So, um, yeah. yeah, it's uh, – my daughters are now calling me Iron Man because uh, I walk <laughs> around with all the, all the metal in and I set off metal detectors. So, um, yeah, it's <laughs> funny games. They asked me how to show them the scar, which goes from, you know, sort of – I don't know, it's about three good six, eight inches long uh, across yeah. the shoulder in the repair. But, yeah. Uh, yeah, I might question modes of transport in the future that have two brains instead of one. But um, <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll see. We'll see what happens. I mean, I might be stupid enough to get back on the horse. Who knows? Yeah, well, I mean, I mean, it carries on to a bit of a rough start to the year, doesn't it? Even when you, you consider share markets now, um, we're sort of. I mean, the news came out of inflation out of the US, <laughs> and then I suppose the the major markets, especially in the US and the tech sectors, they all shut themselves pretty quickly. And then um, since then, I guess there's been a, a bit of a slow recovery, but then you throw in Ukraine and Russia into the mix and that's caused further turmoil. And I guess that key thing, which is just uncertainty and, you know, how to sort of um, eat it up and then and, and spit it back out. And, you know, neck, well, this month, actually, I would say we're, we're going to see that first interest rate increase. But then you've also got a case where a lot of central banks are, I mean, are now on, um, I suppose, interest rates and whether they hold off. It's, it's a really tough argument right now. I mean, it's interesting how everyone's reacting to the the conflict in Ukraine, but the market's actually mm. higher than it was back on the 27th of June when the US Fed's yeah, talked yeah. about successive January. rate rises. January. Yeah, sorry, January. Oh. Yeah, so yeah. it's it's an interesting one where perception sometimes is greater than the actual reality. You know, That's markets right. are more concerned about interest rate rises than the conflict in Ukraine, and yeah. it's a it's a pricing mechanism. The market prices in the contagion risk and all those sort of bits and pieces. And at the moment, mm. the market is still holding up, even with successive down days and excessive up days. We're still 
quite a bit higher than we were back on the 27th of January. So to me, you know, we've put out a lot of content um, out to clients regarding our analysis of, you know, the markets during conflicts. You know, mm -hmm. the, the overriding story is, you know, on average 47 days after the guns start firing, the market is back to where it was um, pre the conflict. So, yeah. and that's our view as well too. You know, there's, yeah. if you go back and look in the, um, the archives of Mr. Rothschild, who was around during Napoleon's days, you know, yeah. he would always say, you know, you buy, uh, you buy on guns blazing, you sell on trumpets. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, I think it's, it's got to hold true. I mean, to us, as long as your time frame is long term and you're holding good quality companies, you know, there is opportunity there. Um, yeah. You know, certainly to, and look, for those who don't want to take the opportunity, there shouldn't be any real worry regarding their um, uh, existing assets either, you know, as long as they're holding mm. quality assets. So, uh, mate, you know, I think that's the big one. Then obviously, March are rolling into uh, an early budget in Australia. Uh, there's That's obviously right. with the uh, the Australian election happening uh, in yeah. May, they brought the budget yep. forward. So 29th of March, uh, Mr. Frydenberg will get up and do his <laughs> spiel. What he's got you in store. The, What's that? I said, do you reckon it'll be it'd be a pretty soft budget again? I would imagine. It's going to be all about it getting re-elected. You know, there's no yeah. reasons for that whatsoever, and you know there will be a quasi rebuilding the economy post COVID sort of thing. So yep. a lot of initiatives have been put out regarding that flip it on the other side, you know, they'll be trying to swing those voters, the swing voters that do make it so important right now, they're not polling well. So it's going to be interesting. And, and, you know, do I think there'll be as much for expats this year as last year? Maybe not. You know, this year will be very much directed at Australian residents and trying to win their, win their favor. Uh, yeah. But, you know, we'll certainly be covering off on all of that. Uh, we've got a full suite of both in-person seminars and webinars uh, starting at the end of this month through to early next month, which I'll put all the mm -hmm. details in the show notes below. But um, you can also go onto our website at thiswealth.com and uh, go into the blog section. There'll be a blog article up there with all the different time sessions, in-person webinar online. We want to make sure that wherever you are in the four corners of the world um exactly. you're able to just be informed and and hear what's going on right. we'll also provide an update on the the proposed tax redundancy rule changes you know that yeah. hasn't gone away it them. has gone quiet but um yeah. you know what are you what are your thoughts on uh on what's going on there well i mean the budget i don't think we're going to see too much apply to expats i'm hoping we see a bit of an update on residency um I think other little things that they'll tweak will be, you know, around superannuation, which they always love to touch. Um, uh, but I think it'll actually be good things around that, contributions, limits, those sort of things. We know that the announcement they made last year in the budget, they're actually finally moving ahead on that. So that's all going to apply as of 1st of July 2022. And the benefit of that is just being able to contribute a lot later into life, you know, up to 74, 75. So that's a good benefit. The residency rules, yeah, Obviously, they're very concerning. Um, I think there's just the new residency rules, they do provide clarity around when and when you aren't a, a resident of Australia. But the, the, the uh, concern is also around, you know, if we're coming and we're a resident of a country without that treaty in place, that 45-day rule is, is pretty clean cut. And, Stinger. And yeah. It is. It is. And there is going to be, act, um, unfortunately, some pretty hard-line advice there uh, for our clients as well as expats where, um, if you're in, you know, some of those European countries, Asian countries, Middle Eastern countries, if you're coming back for more than 45 days and, you know, you satisfy those factor tests or at least two, which I'll be mindful, they are a bit of a catch-all, um, the way they're demonstrated and laid out, then everyone's going to get caught out there. So it means, yes, not coming back to Australia for more than 45 days uh, and spending more time catching up with family outside of Australia. So... Yeah, pretty concerning, but there are going to be workarounds, but I guess um, not really for those in countries that don't have a treaty in place. Those that are coming from countries where there are a treaty in place, well, they're lucky. They've got a bit more flexibility there. So, yes, hopefully there's a, a good update there. I don't think there'll be too much for expats. They've sort of they've touched capital gains tax before on property assets. They've removed the, the concession on the main residence exemption. Um, they might maybe uh, maybe change the tax tiers a little bit. So um, right now, when you think about the first income tax tier for non-residents on certain income sources, that's zero to 120,000 now. That used to be 90,000, and it's 32.5%. So they might play with that a little bit. 
Um, but I don't think it's going to be dramatic. Um, but I guess we'll know soon enough, you know, only only a couple of weeks away. And then uh, keep it out on the socials. We'll be doing those webinars, seminars. And then uh, ideally we'll be also releasing just a bit of a report as well about things that are going to be applying to expats. So keep an eye on that because we can't wait to provide you guys with an update. No, nah, spot on, mate. I think it's a great analysis. And, and to me, you know, this residency rule changes has pretty much received bipartisan support so whether labor or liberal gets voted in it's got to come through mm. the devil will be in the detail in that legislation and the em which we're we're waiting you know previously on but you know there's a lot of talk out there in expat land about when this is coming in and just to sort of provide a bit of chronology for folks out there you know obviously whoever gets voted in in may you know that not a lot's going to be achieved um, between then and 30 June. So more than likely, if there is legislation tabled by either party, it'll be from 1 July to 30 June next year. Yeah. It still has to go through the lower house and voted. still has to go through upper house and be voted. You know, there's a yep. lot of water to go under that bridge. And then in the border taxation support in 2019, they talked about an implementation period of 12 to 24 months. So mm. even if it does get voted in next year, it may not come in until you know, sort of one or two years after. To, and it's going to come down to that detail. So um, it's going to be... Even, uh, when, um, even when they released it, Brent, through that budget, the residency updates, it just seemed rather lazy because they just said refer to BOT report. Like it, yeah, it, there was no... Major. That's right. No explanatory memorandum or anything like that. Um, they didn't revise the report to apply to, you know, obviously a pandemic-ridden world um and it, it was very lazy to be honest uh so they need to go back to the drawing board obviously there's been plenty of accounting firms and, and tax consultants including us providing our, our you know our methodology on how they need to update it and obviously uh, amend what they receive from the board of taxation but we haven't heard anything off the back of that so it does seem like it was a bit of a lazy update to provide in terms of changing something that's been in our legislation since 1936, the Tax Act. So yep. it might mean we might see another update through the budget in terms of maybe a bit more clean cut. They might have finally drafted a bill or an explanatory memorandum, and that's something that we can pull apart. Um, but yeah, a bit of concern around that. And But I agree, it's not a case where uh, it might it might not roll out as quick as we, we think, which does yep. give expats time, but We've also seen cases in the past where all of a sudden something gets legislated very quickly. I mean, you talk about the main residence exemption, that went quiet for a so number MR, of years. MRE mark two, yeah. Yeah, and then all of a sudden it's been, you know, it's it's, it's been signed off and then it applies. So six, six uh, months it, it was from yeah. the second bill being tabled to being signed off, royal assent, when and thank you, ma'am. That's right. So uh, it, it's really hard to know. But I, I mean, when we go back and just look at the budget, yep, it'll be a cushiony budget, an election budget. They want to uh, keep favour. Uh, I don't know if they'll be able to. Um, Scott Morrison, he's not doing not doing well for his party at the moment, especially how he's been portrayed in the media. More yeah. recently with all the floods and everything. The floods he's, and stuff, yeah, he's been hauled upon the coals, isn't he? That's right. He, he just he can't put a step uh, correctly at the moment. Um, so uh, I just don't think... I, they'll, they'll have to give a fair bit to keep everyone happy. Um, yep. Otherwise, I think yeah. out. But, but I'll be honest, uh, prospects of labour also make me scared, scared because they wanted to abolish the, the CGT discount concession. They wanted to remove franking credit refunds. That impacts so many pensioners and yep. investors. Their policies were very scary. So, yep. yeah, it's yeah, it's very whether hard they to learn from Whether they learn from the last election where they did obviously make franking credits and... and the prospect of tax deductibility on on negative gearing an election and they lost that election do they read the two leaves and say you know what let's not touch that because that's a poison chalice or do we give it a second run we've, we've got the numbers coming into the election in terms of um, uh, support in the market who mm -hmm. knows you know it's, it's going to be an interesting one to watch and and no doubt we'll have you know over the next two months a lot of analysis to pour through and uh you know a lot of commentary to provide um, yeah. both on the budget and also the election as well too. But uh, and, and, and I suppose because we're talking about the election, just quickly, just double check, ladies and gentlemen, if you are still on the electoral roll, um, yes. you don't want to get fined. Uh, so if you are going to be voting, make sure you just do it by an e-vote uh, or they, you know, post it out to you because uh, the fine can be quite hefty. Um, so, and if you're obviously not enrolled to a vote anymore because you've left and gone overseas permanently, well, that's fine, you've got nothing to worry about. If you are still, make sure you track down how you can vote online. 
Yep. Or at least get hold of the AEC before the uh, the poll the, the the ledger closes, um, mm. and take yourself off if you are concerned. I mean, it's always been a bit of conjecture in the market, in the expert market anyway, about if you're voting, are you a tax resident or not? There's never yeah. been a definitive answer there. Some people, most people, pay the conservative route and take themselves off that list. But the AEC actually do say that you are legally allowed to vote overseas if you've been overseas for mm. up to five years. Any time yeah. after that, you need to apply on a case by case basis in terms of um, um, yeah being able to enrol overseas. So yeah, that's right. Um, I think let's let's uh, kick on into a really good topic today and. The topic we want to discuss is self-managed super funds. It's something that, that came out from our forum group. And I guess we, we haven't really spoken too much about self-managed super funds because personally, I don't openly encourage SMSFs for expats because there are some, uh, some hefty fines and we can uh, break a, a few rules there with the ATO. Um, but I would say that there are still expats that are out there. They do, they do have self-managed super funds and I guess at some point they probably might run foul of the ATO and get in a bit of trouble there. Um, but I guess it's, it's just something we haven't really talked about too much. But I think before we kick into it, we probably should mention that little fun disclaimer. That jingle. Yeah, <laughs> and unfortunately I have not prepared something witty or, or fun. So long story <laughs> short, folks, the information that you have the pleasure and privilege of listening to today or watching today is for entertainment pur purposes only and not to be considered as personal financial advice. Yeah. That's exactly right. So kicking into it, SMSFs, overseas residency. So firstly, why don't we just do a blank approach of what is a self-managed super fund first uh, and, and how, how does it differ from, I guess, you know, your, a retail super fund like your Sun Super Account or Australian Super Account. So jumping into it, give me, give me the difference between the two. Look, I mean, the difference is it's quite easy and people do say, I'm not sure whether I have one or not. First of yeah. all, you would you would know no, you would know if you had an SMSF. It's actually something yeah. <laughs> you go out and physically set up yourself with uh, with an accountant. So yeah. that's the first test. You know, when you say oh, I'm not sure if I have one, you would know if you have one or not. And and essentially, what it means is instead of a Sun Super being the trustee or Australian Super being the trustee or Host Bus or Res being the trustee, mm -hmm. you're your own trustee, which means you're the governor, you're the gatekeeper, you're the one who is ensuring compliance of that fund with respect to the CIS Act, the SIS Act. So, you know, that's the very start, you know, in terms of do I have one, you'll know if you have one or not. Um, Self-managed super funds are becoming a very big part of the Australian superannuation landscape. And I can't remember the exact numbers, but I think, you know, it's it's over $800 billion now, might be even yeah. higher um, yeah. in terms of funds under management on there. So it is, up there it's not equal to industry super funds i think it's close to it's it's almost you know mm -hmm. getting up there so well, it is, well, it is you've a, got all those you've got all those huge smss from back in the day when they had no contribution caps yep yeah no no there's there's smss out there with over 100 million in them it's it's, it's crazy and there's yeah. back in the days of johnny howard when you said you can plunk a million bucks in and um I know yeah. a lot of clients who did that you know and to them fantastic well, it's it's been a quick side note. I had a call with someone recently who thought, who assumed they could move their very large uh, provident fund into their super with no ramifications. So yeah. it's over a million. They assumed that. Oh, I thought I could just transfer trade in. Yeah. So there's still there's still a bit of confusion around that. But no, you have to abide by contribution caps. Correct, correct, and and that's you know a big mis misconception by a lot of expats who've been overseas for many years, mm. who build up a provident fund or foreign pension, or even just investment accounts and assume they can just turn up to Australia one day and, and drop the whole lot in. Yeah. Um, Self-managed super funds, yeah. retail super funds, industry super funds, they all have the same uh, contribution limits when it comes to how much you can contribute, which is essentially $110,000 a year as a non-concessional post-tax contribution. Um, but, you know, yeah, it, it is a big concern. And we always talk about, you know, reverse engineering that migration of those assets into super because you can't do yeah. it overnight. And more than likely, sometimes it takes up to 10 years for that to occur, just given yeah. how much you can and can't put into super. Uh, but let's steer it back onto SMSFs now because I think, you know, yeah. the next big thing we need to talk about, and this really will frame out, you know, our future uh, comments, you know, in this episode, mm -hmm. in order for a self-managed super fund to be compliant because now you're the trustee, you're the boss, you have yeah. more onerous requirements as say a retail or an energy super fund. Um, and the first one is, you know, was the fund set up in Australia? 
yeah, yep. pretty much everyone's that's the case. The second yeah. one is what we call um, central management and control. Is the is the control the overarching ability to hire and fire, not decision making, but the overarching boss man, boss woman um, control? Is that yeah. in Australia? And that's, that's where right. most expats fall foul because <laughs> they will appoint a friend, family member, someone to act as a trustee on their behalf. Mm. And what will happen is they're still pulling the strings overseas. This person is yeah. their their puppet in Australia, yeah. um, you know, sort of signing off, so to speak, as a trustee. So central management control must be in Australia. It cannot be overseas. Uh, the third right. one is what we call the active members test. And do you want to run through that and, and just talk to talk to folks about what an active members test is in order for that to be compliant? Yeah, well, I mean, mainly at the moment when you assess the active members test, I mean, it, it's looking at firstly the active members within the SMSF. If there's contributions that are going in, uh, I suppose, every financial year, and if that's coming from a non-resident, then I suppose that's going to be a breach of the active members test because when we look at the active members test, firstly, 50% 50, 50 or more of the balance of those funds should be or belong to a normal Australian resident. If it is, and that's the case, and you've got other members uh, in Australia, plus you're overseas, then that's okay. And, you know, funds can still be contributed and that's not really an issue. But when both members or the sole member of the self-managed super fund uh, is breaching the active members test and they're a non-resident at the time, it just means that, you know, they're putting contributions into the super fund. They've got insurance premiums coming out. They're being rather active on the account when theoretically they actually shouldn't based on the rules. So breaching the active members test is probably one of the main ones uh, that causes a lot of expats, a lot of pain and stress with the ATO. Central management control is obviously probably the main one, to be honest. Yeah. Um, and then a lot of the time, uh, I suppose, people try and get around it with that temporary absence rule that exists. Yeah, which is essentially you can be overseas for two years, still have the SMS set up, and not yep. have to undo it where pe that two years and, and being an expat myself, I understand this, that two years goes like that. You know, you're so busy dealing with everything else of life while living overseas. It gets pushed down to priority number 56. And, mm. uh, you know, two years comes and goes, and then suddenly people realise, shit, I'm actually in breach of the, uh, um, in breach of the rules. That's now, right. the biggest problem with the rules, it's not a smack on the wrist, it's not a fine your super fund will be deemed as non-compliant, which yep. means you essentially lose almost half of your balance. Yes, right. Yep. And then if you don't fix it up in the second year, so you get one year to fix it up, you know, if you haven't fixed it up, you'll do it again. You lose up to 90% of your balance. Um, and yes, I do know people that's happened to, you know, ignorance is bliss. You know, they were told X and actually Y. And it's one of the reasons why both you and I don't actively encourage SMSFs. And, and there's a couple of reasons for that. SMSFs back in the 2000s were really the only way you could get control of your super, you know, in terms of you working out whether you want BHP in that portfolio or S&P 500 or that sort of granular control. Yeah. Super's come a long way since then. And unless you're holding um, physical assets, gold bullion, a property, rare artwork, you know, vintage cars. There is no real reason why you now need an SMSF, you know, for the basic fact yeah. that it's, it's you know, um, you can do everything else from a control point of view inside of a retail super fund. Mm. And the other problem two people are realising is the cost of maintaining an SMSF. Yes, if you hunt and do your homework, you can get those costs down. But most of them are just almost on autopilot through an accountant. People are paying five and ten thousand dollars a year to keep these SMSFs going, mm. creating a compliance risk for them, and having that uh, that issue of not being able to contribute to their super while they're overseas. So right. it, it's that sort of it is an antiquated way of looking at things now from a management of your assets. And you know, a week doesn't go by that we don't meet someone who you know has an SMSF, and we recommend winding it up. And we yeah. do that, and it can be done. That's the good thing about it. You can do those things. So, right. you know, I think in that sort of last 10 minutes, it's a good snapshot as to why we don't think SMSFs are a great thing to hold unless it's absolutely imperative because you've got a physical asset in that property that can't be rolled to a retail super fund. In that That's case, right. you do have to do everything you can on that. 
in saying that, last year, in last year's budget, the federal government did make some announcements with respect to changes coming up for SMSFs for expats. And do you want to run through some of those changes and how that may affect people if it does come through? Because the important thing to note is nothing's come through. That's right. So they were going to be uh, providing a bit more flexibility for expats. So rather than having this two-year temporary ad that two-year temporary absence rule, it's it's very it's very it's very bizarre the way that operates because it, it is all under what your intentions are, and that's why it's really important to get private rulings in these cases from the ATO. I remember sitting in on a webinar late last year uh, that was provided by this these expert um, tax consultants, and they were saying that it's all based on intention. So if your intention is only to be overseas for a year, well, it's going to be very hard for you to be deemed a non-resident. Um, and therefore, it's highly likely you can keep the SMS going. If it's a case where you're only going over for two years, but the intention is not a permanent move, it's just temporary, then usually you can lean on the temporary absence rule. If your situation changes, say, 18 months into your contract, and you're going to stay over there for another three years, well, now that's more permanent. And if you don't notify the ATO and change the SMSF and roll back to say normal super fund, that's when you can be found foul of the ATO and breach that CMC and be deemed to be running a non-compliant super fund. Also, you know, if you're contributing and you're a non-resident, then you're breaching the active members test because you should not be contributing to an SMSF when you're a non-resident. That's 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 a clear line drawn in the sand yep. when you do some when you're breaching that test. One of the things that they announced in the budget was rather than having this two-year rule, they're going to push that out to five years. So it does mean that expats that typically go overseas on assignments for, you know, the, the common story and common theme we always hear is, okay, yeah, I was meant to come over here for two or three years, but now I'm up to year five or seven. Yeah. Um, um, so it does mean it, it gives you some extra time to probably get your affairs in order in the event when you head overseas, it's going to be more of a permanent move. You know, it would mean that ideally by year three or four, you know whether you're staying overseas for another couple of years and that gives you time to change your super. Um, central management control, that's always going to be a tough one. Brett said it before where you nominate a family member, friend, um, you know, give them an enduring power of attorney over the, the asset or the SMSF and they make decisions. But it's sort of rubber stamping, um, to be honest. They, at the end of the day, the ATO knows none of the all the assets in that SMSF aren't theirs, they're yours. Yeah. Um, and if you've gone overseas for years and years and years, uh, ATO is going to see through that. But yes, some of the, the, the things that came out was increasing the amount of members we can have with the self-managed super fund. So that's great for families. Uh, I believe right now it's four, but they're going up to six. Six. Yeah. And, then, and then also increasing the time in which you can be overseas from two to five. So that's actually a really good win for expats. Um, but it shouldn't now go and encourage you to go and set up an SMSF. Every couple of years, ASIC releases a statement of, I guess, what the desired minimum balance is in a self-managed super fund. And it's been going up considerably um, since I suppose they started those. Right now, I think the minimum balance they encourage is uh, 750,000 with at least two members yep. and having an investment strategy which encourages a diversified asset class. So yep. you're setting up, an SMSF and you've gone out and bought a commercial property, well, that's not diversified at all. You, you've, you've locked all your retirement assets into this one asset. Um, so it's important to just be mindful of that. Running an SMSF isn't cheap. People forget the rules around what they can do with the funds inside the SMSF. I think there's been a lot of stories where people have gone about set up an SMSF and then because they've technically got access to this, the cash that's in that cash management account, They've gone ahead and used it for groceries and done stupid things with it, which is yeah. a, a huge breach. And then they get fined 10 to 15 grand by the ATO and get told to wind it up. Um, but as Brett said before, um, the, the penalties are very punitive. You know, you can, unfortunately, if you don't wind it up and you're deemed to be running a non-compliant SMSF, they apply the highest uh, ATO tax rate. So that's obviously... 46 and a half, 47% when you factor in the Medicare levy. And that goes on the assets and the income. Um, there have been cases where the ATO has provided, um, I suppose, relief on that. The only case I know of was one of the members was um, deemed to be permanently incapacitated and had, uh, I believe, 18 months left to live. Yep. And they said, and, and their sort of revised amendment on the rule was, okay, we won't charge you the penalty, but you've got 12 months to wind it up. So they still had to wind it up, um, but they didn't have to pay the penalty because of those extreme circumstances. But 
yes, probably the, the major win that hopefully comes through in the next two years for expats to give them more time is pushing out the two years to five years. And also active members too. So they do actually want to allow you to make active contributions to your SNSF while you're a non-resident. Mm. To me, the big but, dot, 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 is yeah. which party is going to be elected in May. Yeah. The reason I yeah. say that is Labor is on the record of not being fans of self-managed super funds. Yeah. Pure and simple. Yeah. So if Labor gets voted in in uh, in May, you think they will, they, shut will they pass? Yeah, will they pass through this these announcements they announced in last year's budget? I don't mm. think they will. I don't. No. You know, I think they'll 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 want to use their their tokens for many other you know sort of party policy you know type uh, pieces of legislation. So. Yeah. You know, don't go out and don't manage an SMSF right now with the view that this is going to come in because it's not a guarantee. You know, at the end of the day, as I said, unless you're holding a couple of key assets that really, yeah. you know, you can't move out of an SMSF. You know, and, and a good example of that I had once was a, was a client who had um, company shares. The whole yeah, portfolio okay. was one stock he, of a company he worked for. Yeah, and yeah. in that case, the only thing you can really do from a compliance point of view was convert it into what we call a small APRA fund, which means it still retains the ability to hold physical assets, but mm. you are no longer the trustee. You appoint a company to be the trustee for you. Unfortunately, when you do that, A, that's incredibly expensive, and yes. B, they will require a sell-down, a mandate. They want to de-risk the portfolio because now it's on their take, not yours. So uh, I never knew what happened with this couple. You know, they sort of, uh, I gave them advice and, and they sort of disappeared off into the nether. But, um, you know, the only way from their point of view to manage this in the compliant way was to wind up the SMSF. Because yeah. if we went the small APRA route, you know, that was going to be a sell down of the company stock, which he didn't want to do. Um, if he wanted to retain the SMSF, then he was going to have to get uh, friends or family members assets into the fund. Um, yeah. in order for them to have central management control. Didn't want to do that. Um, so unfortunately, I think they might have taken the Aussie she'll be right approach to um, managing this. You know, hopefully they never got caught, but um, it is a big risk. And these days with today's data sharing, well, you know, it's out there. So just for the folks out there, you know, just be mindful to seek proper advice on this sort of stuff. It's, it is mm. black and white, these sort of things. It's not like the residency rules where there's that sort of ethereal, subjective interpretation. It is yeah. very clear who's controlling it. You know, number yeah. one, do they have an economic interest in that fund? Number two, and you can't contribute at number three. You know, that's the, yeah. that's, I guess, the, the, the key message from us is it's not just a matter of making your mother or sister a trustee uh, or a director of a company that is a trustee of, a, of an SMSF because... Uh, that, as you pointed out before, that's just rubber stamping. It does not work. Yeah. You know, you're just yeah, and, doing that for the sake of doing it. And I guess, you know, if you're trying to set up an SMSF, go back to the, the problem that you're trying to solve here. If it's a case where, you know, you want to set up an SMSF because you want to invest in direct shares, that's, that's all well and good. But there's probably 15 to 30 different super funds that are treat as ordinary retail super funds that you can do that right now yep. without going through the pain and process of engaging an accountant to set up the legal documents for an SMSF and then you're going to a big bank and setting up a cash management account and setting up a trade account in the name of the SMSF. So, you know, if you, that's the solution that you're trying to, or the problem that you're trying to solve by setting up an SMSF, you don't need to. There's a, there's a more cost-effective way to do it. If you're someone that is trying to invest in physical gold and God forbid, cryptocurrency and um, property, then, yeah, unfortunately, SMSF will be the route that you'll have to, to take to access those kind of assets. But even then, when you set up an SMSF within the trustee, there is an investment strategy which governs that. If the yeah. auditor of your SMSF each year reviews that and reviews your asset classes and the makeup and they find that you're running uh, an investment yeah. strategy, <clears throat> yeah, that's right, doesn't align to what's yeah. in the actual trustee investment strategy, the auditor will make that note and they have to file that to the ATO. So even then, you need to be very careful what you're doing and it's honestly just not worthwhile um, running that risk while you're an SMSF, while you're, sorry, a non-resident. 
I guess another layer is where you're based. You know, yeah. different countries have different opinions on these kind of, I guess, investment vehicles from their own perspective. The US is probably one of the worst. I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole. Guaranteed um, is. But, yeah. Yep. Yep. So it, it's just a case being very mindful of that. Um, and, you know, more often than not, when you're a non-resident, when it comes to different tax vehicles, it's, it's actually quite common to keep it pretty simple, to be honest. Um, simple is good. Few things. I mean, you, you raised a good point on the auditing before, because to me, a lot of folks don't realise that when you are the trustee of your own super fund, you have to get audited, you have to go through returns. And, and if you don't, it's non-compliant and you lose half the balance. Most experts I know forget to do their tax returns, just their own yeah. personal ones. So yeah. this is another layer again, um, yeah. whether you want that or not. And to me, yeah, managing finances as an expat is more complex as it is a resident. So don't make yeah. it any more complicated than it has to be. You know, the KISS method is, is you know, keep it simple, stupid, is, is <laughs> nine times out of 10 the best way to manage your affairs as an expat because you your what's on your plate is so much more than a standard resident. You've got so many things going on. You've got competing financial years and all these bits and pieces going through your head. So, you know, we find that good advice is simple advice. You know, and yeah. I think that's uh, you know, probably the, a, a great spot to leave it on. You and I could talk about you know, it's for a lot of time um, <laughs> in respect to that, and I wouldn't want to uh, clog people's ears up too much more. But I think we made our point. You know, it's 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 only for a very finite few that SMSFs, if you're an expat, works. Uh, yeah. For everyone else, you know, uh, I'd say one in ten works uh, that I see. That's the right. other nine, you know, not a chance in hell. I know, and I, yeah, I'll, yeah, I agree. Brett. We won't go down the rabbit hole. Um, I know in in the past when SMSS became all the rage, accountants or old school accountants used to love them because uh, yeah. they'd recommend common strategies for the self-employed, like buying a commercial asset that you, you know owned by the SMSF and then the business rents off it. Those sort of strategies they can be useful, but um, yeah, as we said before, go back to I suppose the problem that you're trying to solve by setting up an SMSF. And there's more more, more cases now. There's a, there's a cheaper alternative, to be honest. Cheaper, more efficient, and most importantly, a lot easier to manage. Yeah, so, that's right. Mate, I think we'll leave it there. You know, thank you, everyone, for your patience in getting this episode out. I promise to stay off horses for the foreseeable future um, to ensure <laughs> we have more episodes getting out there. Uh, James, thanks very much, mate. It's always a pleasure to have you on. And um, we'll see you guys on the on the next episode. Sounds good. See you guys.